The White Judges. We lived in an old schoolhouse, one large room that my father converted into two stories with a plank staircase leading to the second floor. A single window on the south wall created a space that was dimly lit even at midday. All nine kids and the occasional friend slept upstairs like cadets in rows of shared double beds, ate downstairs in the kitchen near the gas stove and watched TV near the airtight heater in the adjacent room. Our floors were worn linoleum and scatter rugs, our walls high and bare, except for the family photos whose frames were crowded with siblings waiting to come of age, marry or leave. At supper, 11 of us would stare down a pot of moose stew, bannock and tea, while outside the white judges sat encircling our house. And they waited to judge, waited till we ate tripe, watched us inhale its wild vapor sliced and steaming on our plates, watched us welcome it into our being, sink our teeth into its rubbery texture, chew and roll each wet and tentacle piece, swallow its gamey juices until we had become it and it had become us or waited till the cardboard boxes were anonymously dropped at our door, spilling with clothes, waited till we ran swiftly away from the windows and doors to the farthest room for fear of being seen and dared one another to open it. No, you open it. No, you. Someone would open it, cautiously pulling out a shirt that would be tried on then passed around till somebody claimed it by fit. Then 16 or 18 hands would be pulling out skirts, pants, jackets, dresses from a box transformed now into the Sears catalog. Or the white judges would wait till twilight and my father and older brothers would drag a bloodstained canvas heavy with meat from the truck onto our lawn. And my mother would lift and lay it in place like a dead relative, praying, coaxing and thanking it then she'd cut the thick hair and skin back till it lay in folds beside it like carpet, carving off firm chunks until the marble bone shone out of the red-blue flesh. Long into the truck headlight night she'd carve, talking in Cree to my father and in English to my brothers. Long into the dark their voices talking us to sleep while our bellies rested in the meat days ahead. Or wait till the guitars came out and the furniture was pushed up against the walls and we'd polish the linoleum with our dancing till our socks had holes. Or wait till a fight broke out and the night would settle in our bones and we'd ache with shame for having heard or spoken that which sits at the edge of our light side. That which comes but we wished it hadn't like settlement relatives would arrive at Christmas and leave at Easter. Helen Betty Osborne. Betty, if I set out to write this poem about you, it might turn out instead to be about me or any one of my female relatives. It might turn out to be about this young native girl growing up in rural Alberta, in a town with fewer Indians than ideas about Indians in a town just south of the Aryan nations. It might turn out to be about Anime Aquash, Donald Marshall, or Richard Cardinal. It might even turn out to be about our grandmothers, beasts of burden in the fur trade, skinning, scraping, pounding, packing, left behind for British standards of womanhood, left for white melting-skinned women, not bits of brown women, left here in this wilderness, this colony. Betty, if I start to write a poem about you, it might turn out to be about hunting season instead, about open season on native women. It might turn out to be about your face, young and hopeful, staring back at me, hollow now, from a black and white page. It might be about the townsfolk, gentle word, townsfolk 
who believed Native girls were easy and less likely to complain if a sexual proposition led to violence. Betty, if I write this poem. Not just a platform for my dance. This land is not just a place to set my house, my car, my fence. This land is not just a plot to bury my dead, my seed. This land is my tongue, my eyes, my mouth. This headstrong grass and relenting willow, these flat-footed fields and applauding leaves, these frank winds and electric sky are my prayer. They are my medicine and they become my song. This land is not just a platform for my dance. Letter to Sir John A. Macdonald. Dear John, I'm still here and half-breed. After all these years, you're dead. Funny thing, that railway you wanted so badly. There was talk a year ago of shutting it down, and part of it was shut down, the dayliner at least, from sea to shining sea. And you know, John, after all that shuffling us around to suit the settlers, we're still here and Métis. We're still here after Meech Lake and one no-good-for-nothing Indian holding up the train, stalling the cabin syllables, nouns of settlement, steel syntax, and the long sentence of its exploitation. And John, that goddamned railroad never made this a great nation because the railway shut down and this country is still quarreling over unity. And Riel is dead, but he just keeps coming back in all the Bill Wilsons yet to speak out of turn or favor, because you know, as well as I, that we were railroaded by some steel tracks that didn't last and some settlers who wouldn't settle. And it's funny we're still here and calling ourselves half-breed. The Devil's Language. I have since reconsidered Eliot and the great white way of writing English, standard that is. The great white way has measured, judged, and assessed me all my life. By its lily white words, its picket fence sentences, and manicured paragraphs, one wrong sound and you're shelved in the native literature section. Resistance writing, a mad Indian, unpredictable on the warpath, native ethnic protest. The great white way could silence us all if we let it. It's had its hand over my mouth since my first day of school, since Dick and Jane, ABCs, and fingernail checks. Syntactic laws use the wrong order or register and you're a dumb Indian. Dumb, drunk, or violent. My father doesn't read or write. The king's English says he's dumb, but he speaks Cree. How many of you speak Cree? Correct Cree, not correct English. Grammatically correct Cree, is there one? Is there a received pronunciation of Cree? Is there a modern Cree usage? The chief's Cree, not the king's English as if violating God the Father and standard English is like talking backwards, as if speaking the devil's language is talking back, backwards, back to your mother's sound, your mother's tongue, your mother's language, back to that clearing in the bush, in the tall black spruce, near the sound of horses and wind, where you sat on her knee in a canvas tent, and she fed you bannock, and tea and syllables that echo in your mind now, now that you can't make the sound of that voice that rocks you and sings you to sleep in the devil's language. The sky is promising. Danny, come home, it's sunny. 
The ponies are frisky, the sawdust pile is high, the spruce are whistling, and the day rolls out before us. Danny, come home to sky the color of juniper berries. It's summer and time to twist binder twine into long ropes to catch the ponies. Race them to the water trough, listen for the sound of green poplar leaves applauding. And dream of prizes, hand-tooled saddles, big silver buckles, and our victories assure us we have lived our sawdust days well. Danny, come home. The berries are ripe and we've collected lard pails for picking. We're driving up the bench road to fill them with sweet-smelling huckleberries. We'll meet for lunch, use a tailgate for a table, dump our berries into buckets and talk about the patch we found, the deer we saw, the stream we drank from, or the bee's nest almost stepped on. Danny, come home, the sawdust pile is high, and its slopes are sand, dunes we can slide down. At the bottom we can look up and see only the crest of sand and the promising sky. Danny, come home, the men are riding skid horses into camp, watering them at the trough. We can get close, watch their flared steaming nostrils sink into the icy water, see them chew the cool liquid teeth the size of our fingers, water dripping from their chins, throwing their heads back, harness sounds rippling, whinnying to the horses in the corral. Danny, come home. We can walk through the warm pine smells to, to where the men are falling. We can listen to them hollering orders to the skid horses, whose heavy hind legs lever the still logs into a moving universe. Leather and Naga Hide. So I'm having coffee with this treaty guy from up north, and we're laughing at how crazy the Munyao are in the city. And the conversation comes around to where I'm from, as it does in underground languages, in the oblique way it does to find out someone's status without actually asking. And knowing this, I say, I'm Métis, like it's an apology. And he says, hmm like he forgives me, like he's got a big heart and mind's pumping diluted blood. And his voice has sounded well fed up till this point, but now it goes thin, like he's across the room taking another look. And when he returns, he's got this look that says he's leather and I'm Naugahyde. Instructions to my mother. Never list the troubles of my eight brothers and sisters before hearing mine. Simply nod your head and say, uh-huh. Say, I hear you, a lot, and the rest of the time, say nothing. When I am sick, don't list your ailments before I tell you mine. Instead, ask if I need a blanket and a book, and let me eat ice cream bars dipped in dark chocolate. Never call the names of all my sisters before calling mine. When I doubt my creativity, Avoid listing the talents of my siblings first. Instead, dig out my 10th grade sketchbook and homesick letters to you and tell me they are remarkable and that they make you cry. And never tell me I'm getting gray, but that I am wise in skin, sturdy-minded in bone, and beauty-wise in the ways of old women. <laughs>